So um, thank you for uh, joining and welcome to Lead Dev Bookmarked. Lead Dev is a global community of engineering leaders who come together to discuss all things leadership, teams, tools, and tech. Bookmarked is our monthly book club that takes place on the first Tuesday of every month. Our sessions cover an array of engineering and leadership books that our awesome Lead Dev uh, audience can draw insights and practical experiences from. I'm Susan Bond, and I'll be your moderator for this discussion. I'm a former COO of a scaling startup and an executive coach. My specialty is tech leaders. You can find me on Twitter at Susan Bond. Today, we'll be talking about software engineering at Google, lessons learned from programming over time. We'll be moving over to the bookmarked channel in Slack after the live session on Zoom. So if you have questions for Titus, Hiram, or Tom, please pop them in Slack. So let me tell you a little bit about the three folks with me who are here with me today, by the way, which is the first time we've ever had three authors. So at once, super exciting. Um, so Titus Winters is a senior staff engineer at Google where he has worked since 2010. He is the library lead for um, Google's C++, C++, yeah, that's how we say it, code base, 200, 250 million lines of code that will be edited by uh, 12,000 distinct engineers in a month. Wow. Uh, that unique scale and perspective has informed all of his thinking on the care and feeding of software systems. His most recent project is the book Software Engineering at Google, aka the Fleming Go book, published in, uh, by O'Reilly in early 2020. Hiram Wright um, is a senior, a senior staff engineer at Google, where he leads the Code Health team. He is one of the editors of Software Engineering at Google and works to improve the practice of software engineering both inside and outside of Google. Hiram's primary interests are in scalable maintenance of large-scale software systems, particularly their refactoring and evolution. He coined the eponymous Hiram's Law. Tom Manshrek is a staff technical writer within software engineering at Google since 2005, responsible for developing and maintaining many of Google's core programming guides in infrastructure and language. Since 2011, he has been a member of Google's Google Google C++ library team, developing a Google C++ documentation set, launching with Titus Winters, um, Google C++ training classes, and documenting Absel, um, Google's open source C++ code. Tom holds a BS in political science and a BS in history from the Massachusetts Institute of uh, Technology. Before Google, Tom worked as managing editor of Pierce Apprentice Hall and various startups. So excited to welcome all of you. So we know that the, you all three met in New York, but how did the book come about? Thanks, so, go ahead. Um, yeah. Uh, so my project before this had been uh, Absale, which is, like we said, our sort of C++ utility code, open source, all of that. Uh, so we launched that, and that was hard. I was trying to like step back, take a break. Uh, I went back to schools that I went to and hung out with, you know, colleagues from former jobs and stuff, just to try to like reconnect. Uh, and what I found was, you know, after having been at Google for whatever it was five or six years, so many of the places that I was uh, interacting with still hadn't advanced on testing and, <clears throat> and things that, that Hiram and Tom and I just take for granted now. And uh, there was some discussion about Google trying to open source more of our developer infrastructure, our tooling, those sorts of things. And I had the idea, at least, that it would be challenging, to say the least, to sell tools and services that are solving problems that people don't realize that they have. And so I really wanted to, uh, uh, the original proposal for the book was to try to make sure that, like, the lessons that we have learned and the way that we are looking at all of this uh, is written down somewhere so that like, so that we're not trying to like be just, hey, we're I don't know, alien space technology. Here's our magic cubes. Like, uh, what am I gonna do with that, right? Um, and that, that was kind of the original pitch. Uh, then it went on for a while, but yeah. And you know, a big part of it was trying to figure out, like we, we would have these discussions with people outside of Google and again, they look at us like we're from another planet, right? And so 
uh, you know, in terms of refactoring and scalability and lots of the problems that we're having. And this was an opportunity to, to codify that and to really think about it, right? You don't actually learn something until you're forced to write about it and, and forced to like put it down on paper. And so this really forced us to like think about some of these principles and think about some of these things in a way, in a more concrete way that allows us to, to put it down. Uh, concretely, and I would throw Titus under the bus on this one, um, he had this wonderful idea. We'd been, he and I had been talking about this a little bit and I'd left Google for a little bit. I'd come back and I was kind of looking for what that project. And he's like, why don't you write a chapter? And so I started writing and like that became kind of one of the initial pitch chapters that we then did because like I didn't have anything else to do, but I could write for a little bit and that turned into this giant project. Yeah, and uh, from, my, from my perspective, uh, I had been a managing editor at Prentice Hall. So Titus kind of came to me and said, hey, how do you make a book? <laughs> so, so, I mean, and he also, of course, you know, he, he wanted to be involved. And, and to me, this was, this was something that I'd been wanting to do since I joined Google. Well, when I first joined Google as a technical writer, I wanted to document all of the cool things that we were doing. I actually thought about creating a book, not externally, but for Noodlers. Um, and I remember we pitched this and Eric Schmidt at the time said, no, we can't put that book. What happens if someone leaves it at Starbucks? You know, it, they would they would get all our secret sauce. Um, but but the world's different now. And there's not I mean, it's, there is some secret. There, there is not really secret sauce in there. This is just good, less good engineering lessons that we wanted to give to the, the world. Well, that's really interesting, like the change in perspective. Did you all have to sell that? Was it a harder sell or like what changed in terms of like putting it out there over the parameters? I mean, we certainly had executive sign off and review and all of those things uh, and, and some involvement as the project progressed. Uh, but I think there's definitely been a shift in mm -hmm. Google mindset uh, of uh, we, we want to compete uh, on features and quality and things and not compete on engineering practice, right? Like, uh, it's better for everyone, the industry, humanity, like if we can have better software. Uh, so this was sort of like, hey, uh, we'd, we'd like to help if we can. And I, I think we've put enough uh, like framing in the intro pieces. Like we're not saying this is the only way to do it. We're just saying this is what we've learned from having huge, huge scale and long-term problems. Apply it where you will. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah, they, they Sorry, as I said, the intent isn't to like dictate to people. And, and I think Google yeah. sometimes justifiably gets a rap for like telling people how to do things, right? And uh, the intent here was explicitly not to do that, right? Uh, you know, it helps us when we're talking to external colleagues. It helps us when we're talking to people onboarding into Google. I've had so many people I've hired, they're like, what should I do to get spun up on the team? And I'm like, here, read this book and that will help. You know, and so it helps, it helps in that sense, right? And I think uh, selling that to leadership uh, made it easier it made it easier to make that sell to leadership with those kinds of stories in place. That's so great. I have another behind the scenes question. So like we look at this, you know, this guy, there's flamingos here. How did the flamingo get on the cover, you know, <laughs> of the book? Well, I, I mean, I knew O'Reilly would pick. Uh, I mean, I, I reached out to O'Reilly first just because I thought uh, they, they did the SRE book. Um, I also kind of knew O'Reilly anyway and knew how they operate and they're kind of hands off and would let us do what we want. So I reached out to them. Um, I thought that we might be able to pick the animal. And I initially, I initially picked a bowhead whale. I said, oh, this is a whale that lives for 200 years. It can jump out of the water. It's gigantic. Um, and I kind of wanted to make the analogy with our code base, which at 20 plus years is actually pretty long lived in the software industry. Um, mm -hmm. um, they didn't listen to me and they gave us a flamingo. <laughs> so that's, that's the story. Um, but, but we've kind of run with it and, and now we kind of adopted the flamingo as you might notice from some of the various props in our feed here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Titus is the only one not flamingoing it. <laughs> I don't know. Is that the term flamingoing? <laughs> True. I, I don't have it, uh, visible, but I am also actually planning to go get a flamingo tattoo. Uh, <laughs> you are? Uh, Oh yeah, wow. we're there. Yeah, that's, oh my that's God. going you're, you're, far. You heard it here first. Wow. <laughs> wait, wait. Is like on the arm? Yeah. 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 Nice. All right. Yes. Okay. So you get lots of points oh. for that. I, mean, I love how much fun I, you have with it. I mean, it's a fun animal. 
I have a wolf, you know, <laughs> that, that also would have been a, a good animal for me to pick, but you know, I don't think any, I, it's very hard to get a wolf, I think. <laughs> They don't like. They don't tell you why they picked it. Correct? Like you just here's your cover. Nope. Here's your animal. Yeah. Nope. Okay. <laughs> For those of you who are always curious, because people always say like, "Why is that animal on there?" You know, there might be some thinking, but we don't know what it is. I mean, for the system administration book, which is like 20 years old now, they picked an armadillo. And that does make sense. <laughs> if because mm. I was a census admin 20 years ago. <laughs> mm. Got it. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Well, one more behind the scenes question. Um, you know, I mean, this book has three authors, but like contributions from many. And so I'm curious about what the process was like with three authors and many contributors and, and how you all went about that. So when we, when we started with the text, we realized that there are a lot of domain areas that we were not, a lot of domains that we were not the experts in. And we want to talk about everything from static analysis to testing to, you know, some of our tools that, that we use and uh, that we might be experts in some of those areas, but it really made sense to get the experts in those areas to, to write the text. And so we recruited folks, we had open calls, we, uh, we spent a lot of time, we wanted to make sure the book spoke with one voice. And so we, we'd spent a lot of time, you know, working through abstracts and drafts and, you know, how did the, each chapter tie into the various themes and trying to make sure that it had the, a, a common thread that, that ran through the whole thing. Um, and the process itself, actually, uh, looking back at it, mirrors a lot the software engineering process because, you know, doing a bunch of design at the beginning and thinking things through at the beginning uh, really helped. So chapters that had really robust outlines and summaries, and you know, we could tell that people had done their thought, their their homework. Um, that the whole process of writing and editing that chapter was much much easier than chapters where like we we trusted the author was the expert, but they you know, we weren't really sure if they'd done all of the, the 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 thinking yet to kind of get a robust outline. And you know those actually turned out much more difficult to curate as we moved through the process, which I found found pretty fascinating. Um, you know, Tom actually managed a lot of that a lot of that process in terms of just trying to make sure that everyone is on the same page and getting things done. Uh, he did a wonderful job. Thanks. Yeah, no, I, I remember when we kind of decided to, to do this, one of the first things that we all did was we kind of developed a TOC of what we thought. And we really wanted to make it comprehensive. We wanted to cover everything about software engineering. And I make, you know, I use the term engineering precisely because this is not a programming book as you, if you, as, as you know, if you look through it, there is some programming in it, but that's not the point. There's <laughs> well, plenty of other we, places that would teach that. Yeah, can you say a little bit more about that? I'm sorry to jump in there, but I'm curious because you do use the distinction between programming and software engineering. And like, what do you mean by that? And why, why did you make that distinction in this book? Well, that was that was that was the germ that Titus came up with. I'll let him talk. That that was the actual. Mm -hmm. He came up with the thesis for the book. I kind of helped out with the themes, but he was the one who had the pitch for the original mm -hmm. pitch of of uh, programming. Yeah. Uh, so the there there was some like offhand statement that I made uh, internally, like back in 2012 or something, where I said software engineering is programming integrated over time. Like all of the things that are distinctly hard in software engineering have time as an underlying root cause. And this is things like version skew, dependency management, version control, uh, schema evolution, like backwards compatibility, like pick anything that's actually really hard, like any place that you have a really nasty problem in tech, and it's actually a time problem, right? <laughs> and this is completely distinct from sit down, learn to code, sit down, produce code, right? And the, the act of programming, the act of just development is totally valuable, right? There's many things that need a solution, but it is a distinct problem to be keeping that solution working over time. Uh, and as we thought and evolved on this point, it became clear that it's like really the two main differences are time and people. Uh, and then at the point that we were way into editing and, and development, uh, I came across a quote from Dave Parnas, uh, like old school software engineering from like the 1970s, maybe the first conference mm -hmm. on software engineering. Uh, and allegedly the Parnas quote is, uh, software engineering is the multi-person construction of multi-version programs, right? We know that it is people and time all the way back to the beginning, but mm -hmm. it is distinct from programming and 
we just don't see a whole lot of text on that distinction, right? You can see it sort of in like mythical man month. Uh, you can see it in a few places that are talking about code health and, and you know, good design and, and good habits, but like we thought that there was a big uh, gap there. So. That's yeah, and, and, uh, sorry, I was just gonna, not to say that like each isn't important, right? You know, we don't, we don't say that an engineer, you know, if you were designing a bridge, right? The, the steel worker, I'm, I'm in Pittsburgh, right? So the steel worker is just as, as, as a valuable contribution, just like the engineer who designs the bridge, right? But, but it's important to recognize their different skills and they're different, and the same person can have the same skills, right? Uh, but, or can have both skills, but like it, they're different sets of skills. And too often in software engineering, we conflate the, you know, the actual assemblage of a instructions for the computer with the broader, like, what are the problems we're trying to solve? What are the trade-offs we have to make in order to solve those problems? And what's the ecosystem we're doing this in? How is this gonna live for another 20 years? And all those kinds of questions that really aren't applicable when you're just, I'm gonna bang out a three-line Perl script to munge a bunch of text today, right? Like, and, and you know, there's, there's a bunch of interesting things that play into that when you start thinking about these questions explicitly rather than just kind of as a passive activity in your in your process yeah, yeah. most definitely you know i mean i i would say that like part of the the reason we wrote the book is the fact that we don't consider our discipline fully formed yet um you know i i say engineering and it's that's that's aspirational to me right now it's it's not like uh, civil engineering or aeronautical engineering i'm not going to get on a plane that that is going to fly 99.9% .9 of the time or cross a bridge that's 99.9% .9 of the time. If I have to do it a thousand times, I might, but we kind of accept that within software right now. And we'd like to introduce more precise processes is, is uh, to make that more resilient. Um, and time and scale are two of the key things to making it resilient. Um, yeah. the, it, when you, when, when uh, Hiram mentioned how we, interface with the authors, that was one of the big themes that we had was the time scale and the trade-offs. If you if you've read the first chapter, that's kind of what we went at. That was instrumental. Getting those authors to tie those things back together was probably the biggest work that we had to do editorially because I, all three of us pretty much read every single chapter and gave feedback on it many times. <laughs> Your, your point about engineering is, or software engineering is still new and it's maybe not really engineering yet. Uh, there's a quote that I absolutely love from uh, Nicole Forsgren, who's one of the authors on Accelerate, which is great. Uh, Nicole is wonderful. Uh, I was talking with her kind of at the beginning of this project. Uh, and the, the line that she gave me was, uh, you know, accountants still have meetings and discussions about best practices in accounting, right? And accountancy is mentioned in like the Bible, right? <laughs> We're 50 years old. Give us a minute. <laughs> I, I wish I could get a like written version of this to properly attribute to her, but like, I love this idea. I think it is so like, yep, that, 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 that mm. shapes things a lot. Is that going so underneath the flamingo tattoo? <laughs> <laughs> I don't the tiny text, uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love hearing like the philosophical background um, on this. And it kind of leads into another question I have, which is like, there's this huge section on culture, which I think might surprise some people. Um, and I'm curious, like, what role does, you know, call, like, do you see culture playing in, you know, software engineering? And why did you make that section so big? Uh I mean, culture eats strategy for breakfast, right? Like, uh, the, and from the teams that I've been on, that I've been lucky enough to like be a part of or foster, like having a healthy and, and, and sustainable and supportive culture, like those teams can move mountains. And it is night and day different in terms of like individual satisfaction and team productivity to like focus on how to actually be a teammate because it's really hard to learn that accidentally right you can't be trained in that uh in school for sure like you're gonna have to sort of learn it and we thought it was like 
we thought it was probably the most important thing to lead with. And, and it was mm. we felt like it was a little bit of a risk to put those first. Uh, but it's also the statement that, that matches our, our values. Like you're going to win if you actually have good people that are backing each other up and the rest of it, whatever. Like, yeah. I can't remember when we actually put that out there. I don't, there wasn't that much controversy about putting it. almost came naturally that we were going to put these chapters first. I think one of the key things that we were talking about is that we wanted to, we wanted to make sure that engineering was thought of as a team endeavor and that everyone had a role to play. Um, and that's not the common culture, at least as far as like if you're a teenager and you're, you know, you or you watch movies, you know, it's always like Neo in the Matrix solo programming by himself. You see something and they and they 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 don't do any testing. They just do something and something magical happens. Um, and that's not really what happens in software, as you know. So we wanted to really put being a part of the team first. And that was pretty much the the why culture came first. You know, and, and then we decided we had unique processes that we wanted to talk about and that we had we invested in a lot of tooling. So that was kind of how we decided to divide up those major sections. I love that, too. I mean, obviously, The Matrix, so one of my favorite movies ever, mm -hmm. besides The Princess Bride. Um, so I love The Matrix. <laughs> I'm a nerd through and through. Um, but uh, I love that you like the, that the idea of that, like. Because I, I, I mean, obviously, I think culture is very important. Given the roles I've done, I mean, that, for me, it's not a surprise at all. When it doesn't happen, I'm like, wait, where's the culture part? But I think your point is so smart, which is like, we do see engineering as an individual effort, and it's easy to forget that it's a team effort. And that the team, you know, like what we can do together is so important. And multiple yeah, and, and And I would say that, that, you know, I, I went to MIT and I studied computer science when I was there. I never, I, I can't even remember if we studied testing, but this was a long time ago. I know that we do testing now, but I'm not, but I still don't think that we do, we do it in academia as a team. It's academia is, is competition. It's always, you're trying to get the best grades, et cetera, and graduate. And the professional world is much different. And that's, this is part of the reason we wrote, we want to get this book into students' hands. We want them to understand what actual engineering is like. And it's not just the stuff that they're learning, which is computer science is the theory and programming is the application, but engineering is, is the stuff you learn on the job. Yeah. And, and I would just add that uh, culture, like you're going to have a culture. And uh, the question is like, is it one that you are going to explicitly build and like be, be mm. deliberate about, or is it one that's just kind of like going to happen? And to some extent, I would like to say that like, you know, the experiences that we have, at Google or at other software environments are like, you know, someone sat down and planned this all out and everything just happened wonderfully. And that's not true, right? Um, but there are some explicit decisions that that we've tried to make uh, in, within the company that, that try to help uh, foster some of these properties that, that we've talked about in the book, right? And so I think the message is like, encourage people, we would try to encourage people to think about their culture and make decisions rather than just like letting it happen. Because yep. chances are, if you just let it happen, it will not be the thing that you want. And that takes a lot of effort to change in the long term. Mm -hmm. Much like software. <laughs> Much and, like I would, software. and I would add pain too, right? Like trying to change well, old code bases or uh, cultures that are really hardened and brittle, are really painful. <laughs> <laughs> I know the culture side of that. Um, so I want to talk about, I, like I noticed, like for me, I talk about anti-patterns and leadership. So I was happy to see it in your book too. And I'm curious if you can talk about maybe some of the com common anti-patterns you see, like that managers should maybe avoid if we're kind of talking in the culture-ish kind of realm. I think the, one of the insights that, uh, that really stuck with me the idea that so much of our vision of what it means to be a boss, a manager, you know, to be in charge, uh, is kind of informed by this very old model of like being the supervisor on a factory line or, mm. or like older, uh, less, less aware, uh, models of, uh, like the armed forces, right? Like, I'm going to tell you what to do and I'm going to double check it and you have to go do it. Right. 
and you're working with or maybe you're working against people that like they're there but they're not necessarily completely committed to the the cause as it were whereas that's not the case for hopefully anyone in tech or certainly not like the people on our teams right if you trust that the people on your team are committed to the mission for you know whatever your product is whatever your team is then you don't but it's counterproductive to be that sort of like what are you doing are you in your seat are you working right now like uh trust them and they will thrive right and they will do better uh but you do have to take your hands off the wheel a little bit and i see so so many failures in leadership really kind of boil down to uh, still wanting to have your hands on the wheel there, uh, either because you haven't realized that you scaled out of that or because you're trying to model that older mentality of this is what it's like to be a boss. And that's just the wrong vision. Like, you'll, you'll do better if you trust people. Well, and to some degree, can't you, I don't know, this might be total, not totally accurate, but kind of control code you know, a little bit better than you can control in a human. Now, code does its own wily things, especially like legacy code bases and bugs, right? But in some ways, there's a little bit of like, there's a mindset set shift there, I think, in some, you know, I like, I'm, I, I wonder about that, right? Well, one of the things that we, that, uh, you know, and Tanis and I talk about this a fair, number, a fair amount, just, you know, the, the, the computers are the easy part. Uh, the, the humans mm-hmm. are the harder part, right? And, and that's just... Uh, most of us are in, have in engineering backgrounds, right? Like, you know, that's what all my training is. That's why I came into Google as, you know, that's what I've done for a long time. And the reason I like computers is because they do what you tell them to. Now, you may not tell them what you think you told them and they may do things that you don't think they should, but like right. ultimately they are doing what you told them to. Um, and and you, it's unambiguous, right? And like, that's just how this works. Whereas uh, people are not, right? And people, uh, you know, I, I, like I mentioned, I have five children. So like, I, you know, that's a whole nother thing, but there's a lot of actual, actual similarities between like, you know, children and, and, you know, in, a, in an environment where you don't have control over people, you know, and, and I'm not trying to downplay the people that I work with, right. Calling them children, but you know, just, I'm, I'm digging a hole here. I know, but um, <laughs> the, the point is, the point is that, uh, you know, you, the people are the hard part, right. You can't control people uh, in, in your life. And especially even in a work environment and, you know, we can go and we can say like, you will code to this standard or else you're fired. Right. And pretty soon you won't have people working for you anymore. Right. Cause no one wants to work in that environment. And, you know, you have to be able to work with people and, you know, we, we rule by the consent of the governed in some sense. And so, um, you know, it's, it's how do you get their consent and how do you build an environment in which people want to do things and where you can trust them to do things uh, rather than, and trying to, where you have to force them to do things, you know, a very Machiavellian kind of way of looking at it in some sense, I guess. Well, and, and as like Titus alluded to, I mean, what, what we are is in some sense a creative class, you know, so, so motivating a creative class is much different than mo- motivating, you know, an automaton or, or anything like that. That's, it's not going to work. You might be able to get some, some short term gains <laughs> through, through these things, but I, and I'm just, you know, first of all, it's just being a good human and being doing being, doing the right thing. That is forefront. Um, but over time, you can't have a, a culture that's that that sort of corrosive. It will eventually come back and bite you. Um, so I think that that's why most companies. I mean, Google is not unique in this respect, but they do recognize that the motivations need to be done in that way. I think Google is especially good about treating managers as just another part of the team. Though I will say that that we we sometimes separate the tech lead and the managerial roles, and the managerial roles are mostly about supporting the engineers that report to them, rather than dictating what they do. Um, and I do like that. That's so great. Love getting the behind the scene glimpse. Um, I'm going to shift our conversation just a little bit. Um, uh, so. 
there's also multiple chapters on testing, which is probably, that part's probably not surprising. Um, and Google has come a long way from its early days where engineering driven testing wasn't seen as important, according to you all, I was not there. Um, but I'm curious, like, how would you describe, you know, the, the philosophy of testing at Google today? And again, we know it's not Google's way and that Google's telling you to, but I'm sure there are people who are curious about like, how does that all, how are they thinking about it? Well, I, I, I worked with a lot of the testing folks, um, so, so I'll speak first. I, I also joined earlier, so I have insight into what Google was like in 2005. Um, and I, I'm not going to say that it was devoid of testing. It was good teams did test, but there was no edict and, you know, mm. to test. Um, we certainly didn't have anything like continuous integration at that time. We had, we had a build mechanism, but it was very bare bones. But it was more along the lines of, as Google grew, we figured out that the way we test is, is not so much about making sure that your code works, but making sure that everybody else's code works with your code, which mm -hmm. is a subtle distinction. But when a co code base is that large, 99% of the things that will break are going to be someone else's dependency on you. And that was what it escalated over time. Um, so it's, I, I'm sure it's an insight that other large companies have come to at the same time. Um, testing is no longer considered, you know, uh, 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 a nice to have. It's necessary at this point. Yeah. And I think one of the places where this really shines and, and really kind of gets to the heart of it is we have this sort of policy uh, that we jokingly call the Beyonce rule, uh, which is if you liked it, you should have put a test on it. Uh, and specifically, we have this because uh, in an environment where we're trying to keep the code base alive and make necessary changes, you change the compiler, change your runtimes, update your libraries, all of these things, right? Uh, when there's, you know, 250 million lines of code at, in play and who knows how many teams and products, I can't ask every team about their release process to figure out whether or not my change is safe. Like, that's clearly not going to work. And so... Instead, what we use is the unit tests that are checked in and that just work for everyone. Like, there's no setup. It's just consistent. It's uniform. Uh, as an oracle for, if I make this change, is it safe? Right? Sometimes that's going to be wrong. Sometimes that is wrong because you didn't have test coverage, and then that's on you. Right? And this turns out to be a wildly more efficient way to structure your policies and questions around how do we tell if a change is safe, right? The, the, the evidentiary barrier or bar is not perfect truth, right? You're never going to get that without actually deploying it to production. And that's very risky, right? So we need an Oracle and turns out that the best way to do that is run the tests. I love that. Uh, that's great. Um, I also want to talk about large scale change. Um, but first, you know, um, can you talk about um, like making sure we all understand what do you mean by large scale change? Like, how, can you define what you all mean by that when you talk about it in the book? So <laughs> I think the opening chapter of the large scale changes or the opening line in large scale changes chapter says something to the effect of what is the biggest thing you could check into your code base at your company, right? Like what is the largest size of change? How many files does that touch? How many you know lines does that change? Whatever. Okay, now bigger than that, right? Like, um, and that's gonna differ in each environment. Concretely at Google, we're talking about uh, logical changes, right? Places we want to change something that may touch tens or hundreds of thousands of variables or function call sites or some other kind of metric, right? So like, you know, we, we have hundreds of millions of lines of code and we want to change, you know, some, still not in the percentage, you know, single digit percentage, but like some large number of those things, right? And it's bigger than we can submit in a, in a change. And there's all kinds of reasons why that might be, right? Like merge conflicts or testing or rolling back, all kinds of stuff. Um, but we're talking about like changes that are logically the same. Right, like I'm I'm changing every function from A to B, every function call from A to B, but I can't do it all atomically. I have to split it up in some in some way. Ah, okay, great. And like, how do you all go about taking these? Like, 
what's, I, I'm, I don't know, that feels a little overwhelming for me. I'm like, how do you go about doing this? What are the sort of the principles or, or the ways that you all think about it? So the, the principle is, is generally we want to be able to decompose some large change into small, more independent pieces. So for example, if I am changing all of the callers of function A to function B, right? Like I need to introduce function B to start with. And then, but most of the time I can move those callers independent from each other. And so that now means that I can use, uh, I can test and submit and review all those changes independent from each other. Uh, and then at the end of the day, I can remove function A. Presumably I'm moving, migrating callers because I want to eventually remove the old API or the old thing, right? And I can, I can remove that thing when I'm done. Um, and so what you've done is you've taken a highly serial process and broken it down into a parallelizable process. Hmm. And if you kind of turn your head and squint a little bit, this looks a lot like a big data problem. Uh, this looks a lot like MapReduce uh, and, and that algorithm. And so that's what we do. We apply kind of a MapReduce technique to our code base and to generate the changes. We apply the same kind of technique to test them and review them and submit them and get them uh, into the code base. And uh, we've built a bunch of tools around that. We've built a bunch of policy around that, right? Like once you have a big giant change producing bazooka, you actually need to have some kind of controls over who gets to use it. Uh, and it's not that we're controlling who gets to use it. It's more we want to make sure that uh, people are using it responsibly. So there are folks that well-intentioned would like go run the spell checker all over there, all the comments in the code base. And that's probably not the highest use of that tool, right? Like that's probably not quite the, the technique that we want to do. But, you know, maybe you have a, like, maybe there's language in your code base you want to change, or there's a system whose name changes and you want to be able to update all the references to that thing. Or maybe, you know, there's some other kinds of thing you need to, to deal with, right? And those are all reasons why you might want to deploy tooling like this. And so we have a, we have an oversight group that helps kind of establish uh, policy and, and offer suggestions, right? It's low enough overhead that people can get counsel and guidance. Like I'm trying to do this thing, how do I do it, right? And so mm. um, like with most of the problems that we have, there's the technical solution, you know, I got to build a bunch of tools, but there's also the policy side of, you know, how do I make sure the tools are effectively used and how do I help people use them in a, in a better way and, and that kind of stuff, so. And I, I think That's there's what, also, uh, uh, a typical software pushing the boundaries paradigm there, because I know that the changes that we do now, we did not think were possible three years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, we would have, 10 years ago, we might've said they were theoretically impossible. <laughs> um, but we now know that that they are possible. So no, nowadays, when we, when we come up with, you know, let's say there are more complex changes than changing from A to B. We have many more complex changes than that. But we always kind of go like, is the, we've never done this before, can we do this? And more often than not, we figure out a way to do it. Um, so, so I would you know, suggest to other people if they're thinking about this, that there are boundaries that you can push there. You know, there, the, 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 we, we have great tooling at Google. Google. Um, Hiram you know, uh, built out this process in some respect. Um, but the tooling is is what drives this now, and it, it's it's it really is what enables this in everybody's hands um, to to get accomplished. Yeah, and it's been a major like cultural change as well. Like I remember mm. 2013, 2014, we had long discussions, especially with leadership, on like, hey, there's this thing that's used. I think it was 35,000 times in the code base can we change that? Like, that seems like a big number. And scared of churn was the pretty common sort of vibe uh, for a long time. And we've eventually gotten to the point that like, this is used all over the place and it's not good. That's the most important thing to fix. Like the question about churning, like making too many changes has just vanished. Because uh -huh. nowadays like, oh, there's 50,000 things that need editing. I'll see if anyone has an afternoon. It's fine. Like this is not even a like quarterly planning thing. This is like a this will take a week maybe, and it's a background task. No one cares. It's fine. So. Yeah, wow, that... we we I frequently get people showing up. You know, on the cultural change, there's frequently frequently people that show up. I run the team that manage the tooling, and uh, they will come and say like, "Why isn't my code base getting changes?" 
Like, like I, I expect for the tools to show up and be improving my code base. Like, what's, why isn't this happening? You know, and that's an interesting paradigm shift for, you know, 10 years ago, people would have been like, I don't, automatic tooling, I don't know. Like, all of my code is like this bespoke custom stuff. Like, I'm not sure if the custom, if the tooling is going to do the right thing, you know. And now, now people are anxious to see the automated tools run, run around and fix things for them. Yeah. And it leads to great efficiencies at scale because when we're doing things like language version updates or changing to new like uh, idioms and patterns and things like we write some tooling to identify the old pattern that we don't like and then the teams that are responsible for the language infrastructure people like us people like our coworkers in other languages blow through and update the whole code base we're like we're not telling everyone you need to go do this thing like uh we'll just take care of it for you it's fine don't worry about it um, and this lets people focus on their own business while we go become esoteric experts on this weird skill. So. I love this. this is so great. I've just got one more question. We we uh, we need to wrap up here. I you all are so fascinating. I want to keep talking, but um, I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna make you play favorites. I know this is like you know Hiram. You understand like which kid is my favorite. Um, you know, you know, it's a hard one to answer, but like, what's one thing I would love to hear from each of you. What's one thing you would love people to take away from the book, you know, or thing that you think maybe like you want to call out about the book that you want people to sort of think about. So I will not say Hiram's law because uh, <laughs> that sounds a little bit self-serving. Uh, I, I did not name that. I made the observation and Titus named it and, and I blame him for naming it. Um, so I will not say that. Uh, I will actually say the just the notion of time, right? Like it's it's right up there at the beginning of the book, and it's something that seems obvious for a lot of a lot of reasons. But like very rarely when we sit down to write a piece of code, do we start thinking about how long will this have to live, and how long will this be around, and what kinds of evolution will it go through in that time period, and how am I going to plan for that? And you know, I'm not saying that every first year computer science student needs to plan for the next OS upgrade in their over the course of the semester. But, you know, they, it, it's worth thinking about, you know, it, it, especially in a, a professional environment, you know, how is the ecosystem going to change? And we don't live in a world of like boxed software sitting on disconnected laptop or disconnected computers anymore, right? We're, we're it, the eco, we are in a collective computing ecosystem, which changes and if my software is going to be around for a while, it impacts the kinds of change I have to be able to react to. And that's, that's something I think that is still a very infrequently thought about aspect of, of software engineering. And so if folks take that away, then I'm, I'm pretty happy. Love it. Yeah, I, I probably, I mean, that is the theme of the book. So we are playing favorites here. So Hiram took the, took the easy way. <laughs> Um, I, you I, can also I would, say ditto if, unless you have something <laughs> different. <laughs> no, I, I have to say something different now. You know, it's like you can't order the same thing at a at a at a, at a restaurant. <laughs> um, I would say I would say it's the the concept of engineering as a team effort. Um, I mean, I, I think that's that's not a new insight, but I think that the way we we illustrate uh, how how it's done, I is is to me an important way. It, it's it, it's important for scaling. Um, I think one of the key thing about leadership is um, I like that always be leaving quote that I think Ben Collins wrote, uh, which is the fact that you should, if, if you're a proper manager, you should be always thinking about who's going to succeed you. You should be presuming that you're going to scale and be successful. Um, so I, I think the the whole concept of, of, a, of a team around engineering, um, and I, I admit I'm a little bit biased because I'm a technical writer working with an engineer. So um, I like it when they're, when they behave like a team. <laughs> Love it. And Titus, how about you? Uh, that's tough. There's two that I really like, but I think I will go in the end with the first uh, big insight that didn't come from any of us, uh, which was in the build systems chapter. Um, mm. And everyone just kind of glosses over like, yeah, it's a build system, whatever. It's, you know, who cares? It's just a paint color. It doesn't matter, but it does. Um, and the, the evolution that is shown in that chapter, uh, Eric did a great job with this, is like everyone, you know, you start, you write one command line, you invoke the compiler, you build your thing. And then you write a little shell script because you got tired of listing all of the things on the command line. And then you write 
some logic in a make file or whatever uh, to say like, okay, what are the pieces that I need to do and what are their dependencies? But what that's missing is any notion of state and side effects. It's a time problem. Again, state is a time problem, right? And if you actually level it up one more kind of surprising level so that your build system is actually operating like a functional language where there are no hidden side effects, where the build machinery knows all of the pieces, then as soon as you get that, you can actually have like, if you have to run, you know, make clean, build clean, whatever, uh, your build system is bad, right? And if you have these properties that your build system is good, then it caches and paralyzes and you like, it's night and day different. And this is the one lesson that I still think, like, I think we still sound like aliens with weird magic tech uh, when we tell this story, because I, I genuinely don't think that people understand, like, how deep, like, it's amazing when you actually have a proper build system. Uh, and I love that you called so much stuff. I love that you called out to like a chapter that people might overlook because that's part of it too. Sometimes I think people overlook what we're like, hey, look at that. So um, thank you so much for joining us for this session. Um, such a fun, lively conversation. Um, Tyrus, uh, Titus, Hiram and Tom will be joining us over on Leave Dead, Leave Dead Stack. We'll be the, where the Slack, wow. My voice is tired. <laughs> where they'll be taking some questions, head over to the Bookmarks channel where that'll be taking place. Our next session will be on um, January 11th in 2022. Can you believe it? Um, where we'll be speaking with Emily Freeman on her book, DevOps for Dummies. And on February 1st, we'll be talking to with uh, Roy Oshavov, probably messed that up, on his book, Elastic Leadership, Growing Self-Organizing Teams. Thanks so much, everybody. <laughs>